war. Concept art. A form of illustration used to convey an idea for use in films, video games, animation, comic books, or other media before it's put into the final product. Some ideas are submitted after the design artist and director come to a mutual agreement on what can work. But other pieces of art never leave the cutting room floor. Most Transformers fans, when I first saw the designs of the movie, I was like, what? They changed everything. It's completely different. What's going on here? What's up, guys? My name is RBG, bringing you another Top 10 Transformers video. This is something where we take the best and worst elements of the live action films and comprise them into top 10 rankings. For today's video, I wanted to present a list featuring the top 10 unused concepts from the live action Transformers movies. Over the years, we've seen so many awesome designs grace the silver screen in the TF films, and for better or worse, they've all been creative. Something that I always found amazing is how the design artists were able to reinvent certain aspects to these iconic characters, making them more popular than ever. Seeing stuff like this shows that they are willing to take these creative steps to elevate the product. With that said, there have been so many mind-blowing pieces of unused artwork that we'll never see translated to the big screen, so I'm going to rank my top 10 today. Now before we get started on the video, I gotta give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, TubeBuddy. As a successful YouTube user, I often get questions asking what I use to get my videos tons of views, and the answer to that is TubeBuddy. This thing has helped me take my channel to the next level in ways I never imagined. It's a browser extension that helps new and experienced YouTubers grow fast and optimize their channels. I've been using this extension for years and it's constantly getting updated with new features, like the SEO tool that helps me come up with the perfect title, description, and tags to get more people to click on my videos. It even provides you with analytics besides your videos to see how much traffic your video is generating from various social media sites. The extension is absolutely free, but as a special offer, we're giving a 50% discount for channels that have less than a thousand subscribers that purchase the Pro Upgrade. All you have to do is enter in the code RISINGSTARBUDDY. So if you're interested in starting a YouTube channel or taking your content to the next level, download the extension now. You can do so by clicking on this link that will be provided in the description of this video. Number 10. The Stealth Ship Something that's been lacking in the live action Transformers films are sub-aquatic stealth vessels. We've seen Transformers hit the road and take to the sky, but for some strange reason we've hardly seen any robots who specializing in attacking from underwater. Of course, we've seen some supposed aquatic vessels who were said to be Transformers like the HMS Alliance Submarine in Transformers The Last Night, but we never actually saw one transform into action, which is a bit of a bummer. You want to know what else is a bit of a bummer? How about the fact that there were actually plans to introduce these badass bots in all their transforming glory? It all came about during the production of Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. As you're all aware, the movie features some pretty solid underwater scenes such as the Megatron Resurrection and the naval carrier attack at the Atlantic Ocean. And initially, there were actual plans to introduce a stealth ship Autobot called Depth Charge. His vehicle alt mode would be a Visby class Corvette ship and his robot mode would stand at a staggering 150 feet tall, making him the largest Transformers in the movie verse yet. And if I were to take an educated guess, it probably got axed for budgetary reasons. They already had Devastator, who was obviously one of the selling points, who stood at 100 feet tall. Apparently, it took a lot of hard drive power to render him, and the bigger these characters are, the more expensive it is to bring them to life. So, compromises were made and this mystery stealth ship transformer was shelved. On the bright side, this concept didn't completely go neglected. Depth Charge's design was used as a redeco for a Decepticon toy called Sonar that same year. If you want, you can see more of Sonar's personality in the movie tie-in comics such as Transformers Nefarious and Rising Storm. Number 9. Bumblebee's Hammer Bee's solo outing has caused a bit of confusion since it was announced. During production, the film was referred to in presentational material under a variety of names including Transformers 6, Bumblebee the Movie, The Bumblebee Movie, and Transformers Universe Bumblebee. And this initially made fans including myself assume that this film would take place in the Bayverse continuity. Things most certainly aligned well with it like the Sector 7 elements like Agent Simmons' brief cameo and Megatron supposedly being hidden away under the Hooper Dam. Something else that would have made this film fit in well with the previous TF movies is the inclusion of B's Sledgehammer. This weapon has no in-universe explanation behind it. It just randomly appeared in B's World War II backstory and during his fight with Optimus Prime during Transformers The Last Night. Nonetheless, this was an awesome melee weapon for B to have, and according to the lead artist Josh Nizzy, it was going to make a return in B's solo film. Early in production on the Bumblebee movie, he was asked to do an alternate version of the Sledgehammer from Transformers The Last Night. The producers were liking the idea that the Autobot and Volkswagen logos would leave an imprint, but it ended up being scrapped. Now, if you ask me, this would have been an awesome thing to see. B kicking ass and leaving a huge Autobot imprinted on it as he does would have been dope. I want to address this later in the video, but something tells me that Travis Knight and the producers still weren't sure if the movie would be canonical with the previous entries, so they literally ended up laying the hammer down. 
can't do this. Number 8. Optimus Primal. Shortly after the release of Transformers The Last Night, concept artist Furio Tedeschi shared some pretty sick concept art. We got unused concepts for things like Transformer Knights, and there was even a giant snake transformer. But the creme de la creme would have to be this sick concept art for the maximal leader Optimus Primal. This art really blew my mind because I never imagined that Michael Bay would even consider putting this guy in a movie. If you ask me, Beast Wars is just one of those properties that doesn't get enough respect from G1 fans. Whether it be because it completely ditched the original cast or the CG animation, which I honestly find ironic since CG animation was used to bring their favorite Cybertron scene to life in Bumblebee, but I digress. I think it's so crazy that the big bot himself was going to be introduced in this movie, considering the fact that Furio Tedeschi mentioned that he wasn't even sure that Primal made it in or not, and that he had to see the movie for himself to be sure, really makes me believe that Optimus Prime almost made it in the final cut. Well, that's just Prime. Number 7. Breakaway this entry is arguably one of the most polarizing unused concepts on this list, because even though he was never seen in the movies, he is in fact seen in a lot of promotional materials such as the games, toys, and comics. It's like he's there, but he's not actually there if that makes any sense. You know, Breakaway was apparently going to be in the Revenge of the Fallen movie at one point. You can see his awesome concept art done by Ben Porter under the working name Firestorm. And if you ask me, he would have been a game changer for the Autobots to have on their roster. Considering the fact that they don't really have any flyers on their roster other than Optimus Prime, they could have really used him to combat the likes of Megatron, Starscream, and Nitro Zeus. According to T of Wiggy, he's an Aerobot, which is a class of airborne Autobot warriors trained to function in a small unit against Decepticon forces. In Revenge of the Fall in the video game, he was the sole flyer who possessed a fusion beam sniper rifle that allowed for precision and long range attacks. You could play with him during a mission where you had to guard the Lorithian Abyss against Decepticons looking to resurrect Megatron. If you ask me, this would have been the perfect time to include him in the movie. Although it hasn't been confirm as to why Michael Bay chose not to use him, I have a nagging suspicion that it's because he was adamant that the characters with military base forms strictly serve as Decepticons instead of Autobots. Number 6. B Spinning Wings One thing I noticed about the designs in Transformers Age of Extinction was how they were markedly different than the previous three films. The robots have less alien appearances and are more heavily influenced by human forms with less visible car parts. They're now based on specific types of human combatants throughout history. Optimus is based on a medieval knight. Hound heavily resembles a World War II era commando, Crosshairs looks like a mercenary or assassin, Drift is obviously a samurai, and then you have B who is apparently based on a ninja. Honestly, B's design is my least favorite of all the other designs. It's just too busy and pointy for my taste. Not to mention that his proportions make him look like a character from Mega Man with the small upper body and huge legs. Something that always pissed me off is how he has these gnarly looking spike wings on his back but they really don't have any practicalities to them. Considering the fact that they're literally ninja stars, you'd think he'd actually do something like, you know, throw them? And apparently there were plans for B to utilize these little nodes in combat. While it isn't explicitly explained in articles and interviews, based on this concept art you can see that he was supposed to equip them on his wrists, and they will function as these spinny buzzsaw thingies. If you ask me, they should have really considered going with this concept because they would have made for some cool looking weapons. They already stand out on B's back, so why wouldn't you want to make them practical? Number 5. The Armored Weapons Platform Optimus Prime's trailer is arguably one of his most iconic traits. Without it, his vehicle form just looks naked, you know? And this was made apparent when we saw him riding without it in the first two films. After introducing viewers to the jet power Optimus Prime and getting an enormous reception, Michael Bay thought to himself, hey, why not do this again except bigger? So to please the G1 fans who are wondering what happened to his trailer and to explain what happened to Jetfire's parts, he introduced the Armored Weapons Platform or Weapons Bay. To make all of this possible, the designers created a 53 foot Great Tame refrigerator trailer to carry all of his weapons. This thing featured a lot of cool toys for the Autobot leader to play with, but the only thing we saw him use was an Energon sword and shield and the flight capable Omega Combat armor that came equipped with its own set of weapons. Which is a bit of a letdown since these concepts show that there were a lot of devastating weapons Optimus could have used in the film, like this giant chainsaw and shoulder mounted missile launcher among many other things. Can you imagine the sheer amount of destruction these weapons could have caused? Complete ponage, bruh. But anyways, although these weapons weren't displayed in the movie, you can however play with them in the Dark of the Moon video game. Whatever you're up to, it ends here. Now. Number 4. RC Sisters Combiner 
there is not much to say about this version of RC and her sisters. Their inclusion in Revenge of the Fallen left a lot to be desired, and even though they've mainly been described as three beings sharing the mind of one, it was never specified in the film. According to the story writers, the sisters were originally going to be written as a singular entity, but Michael Bay wanted them as individuals. And if this is Bay's intention, it doesn't particularly come across in the movie as the trio doesn't really do much of anything. Something that would have definitely made them stand out in the film is the idea of them combining. It was originally intended that the three individual RCs would combine into a singular larger robot in the film, but Michael Bay chose to drop the idea for fear of the confusion it would cause given how much else was going on in the film. The idea was greenlit until it was scrapped later in production. Both an unknown designer and Steve Jung drew up concepts for what this badass form would look like, and it appears in both the film's novelization and the animatic Shanghai battle scene included on the Revenge of the Fallen DVD. They say two heads are better than one, but this transformation makes that famous quote seem like an understatement. Number 3. Megatron's Holding Room This is another one of those questionable things I mentioned earlier regarding Bumblebee, and it ties to the Bay films. I wanted to expand on this once I got to this part of the video, but originally Bumblebee would have served as a more direct prequel to the 2007 movie. The original cut of the film did not include any scenes set on Cybertron, and instead opens with a shot of Earth with some expository narration by Bumblebee, who laments that he is now being hunted by the humans after being sent to protect them and declaring mankind isn't worth saving. This cut also featured a post credit scene with Burns, Simmons, and Waylon discussing the Autobots can never line up NBE-1, Megatron who was frozen in ice like the 2007 movie, albeit redesigned with a more G1 style look. But it was later replaced in the final cut by an entirely new scene of Optimus Prime and Bumblebee watching more Transformers arrive on Earth and of Charlie finishing her and her father's car repair project. Apparently, these elements were dropped during reshoots following feedback from test screenings. And having already received negative commercial and critical reception to the last night, Paramount was concerned that it would drive viewers away. I honestly don't think it would have been a bad move to include the scene since there were already plenty of instances that further drove the idea that this was in fact a prequel to the Bayverse. Funny enough, the idea had already been implemented in a motion comic feature on the Bumblebee Blu-ray, where we actually see Megatron encased in ice and featuring his design from Transformers 1. If he ever wakes up, We'll need all the help we can get. Number 2. Optimus Prime Cybertron Form The opening scene of Bumblebee was a thing of beauty. After getting a brief glimpse of this moment in the trailers, fans were instantly stoked and reassured that this film was in the right hands. It was bursting with G1 love, from the faithful designs to the familiar atmosphere on Cybertron. It was simply a thing of beauty that left us wanting more. What I enjoyed about this scene was how all the characters featured pre-Earth robot forms and vehicle modes. Well, all but one that is. For some unexplained reason, our boy Optimus' robot form sported what looked to be some Earth-based truck parts. Which is weird because for him to feature these things, he would have had to have gone to Earth at some point and returned to Cybertron. But I don't think this was something the fans were really concerned about since their favorite Robo-Jesus was back in all of his G1 glory. Surprisingly enough, this was Paramount's main reason for not giving him a Cybertron form. According to the special effects team, Optimus was originally going to have an extended role in the opening sequence where we witnessed him in his Cybertronian vehicle mode. But this proved to be too time consuming and the producers wanted to keep his more familiar G1 design. And this really disappoints me man. I feel like this form would have looked super cool on screen. If Paramount was so adamant about making him look familiar to fans, I don't see why they couldn't just use the G1 look in the trailers but keep the form in the movie. They did something similar with Sonic in his movie where he's seen wearing his signature red and white sneakers in his trailer, but he doesn't get them until the tail end of the movie. So they could have easily done this with Optimus. I also feel like this form would have made for an awesome action figure. I guess beggars can't be choosers. Number 1. The Gladiatorial Arena one of the less reputable aspects of Cybertron before the Great War was the fact that gladiatorial combat was one of the most popular sports. And when you think of this sport, Megatron instantly comes to mind. Something that fans have been asking for since these live action films have been conceived is moments that hark back to the gladiatorial days of Cybertronians. We want to see how Megatron was able to sharpen his combat skills during these brutal events. And it looks like Michael Bay was going to give us what we wanted in Transformers The Last Night. As you can see, Optimus Prime and Megatron were supposedly going to do battle in a gladiatorial arena field with hundreds of spectators, and this would have been super dope. I always felt like Optimus and Megatron never really settled their score in the Bay films. In each sequel, Megatron played a second fiddle character, and the bout between him and Optimus was so uneventful that it shouldn't have made the final cut in Transformers The Last Night. We were brothers once. Once. <laughs> If you ask me, a gladiator duel to the death would have been the ultimate bookend for the two rivals. Here's hoping that we get it in a future film. 
But with that, I'm going to end this video. I hope you all enjoyed it because there were a ton of unused concepts to choose from and I feel like I picked the ones that are worthy of this list. If you have any that you know about, I'd absolutely love if you list them in the comments below. As always, I ask that you like or dislike the video. It doesn't have to be a thumbs up, it can be a thumbs down. Any feedback is good feedback and will only help me improve on future videos. But if you really enjoyed this video, it would help me out tremendously if you shared it with all your friends and followers on social media. If you want to support the brand, you can pick up a What Would Robo Jesus t-shirt from teesprings.com and it will also be listed under this video. But once again, this is your boy RBG, signing out on another video. I will catch you guys later. Peace out.